So uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the third day. It's a pleasure to have Alix de Report for the first talk about civic classical Bergman kernels and analytic regularity. Thank so, you for thank the you. presentation. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers, Georges Marinescu and, uh, and Daniel Greb, uh, for organizing this this very nice and cool conference. And it's a pleasure to be to be here. Um, so. Uh, you know, uh, for the topics of the conference, I'm more of a, an analysis kind of guy, and I will talk to you about semi-classical analysis um, and um, the asymptotics of, of Bergman kernels for um, large exponential weights or equivalently large powers of, uh, uh, of a line bundle have been known for some time. And recently, there have been an increase of activity in the real analytic case, we can say more. And I would like to present you with, you know, what it takes to know more about this. Uh, but, you know, I will explain, try to explain everything to you. So, you know, what it is we're studying, uh, what are the results, why do we care? And uh, importantly, what are the tools? And the tools are uh, analytic, semi-classical analysis, analytic as in, you know, real analytic, uh, regularity. And uh, I will try and explain to you the two original proof strategies um, by myself and by uh, Ruby, Vignoc, and Jostrand, um, who first uh, yeah, achieved this results. Um, okay, so what is it we're interested in? So um, I first talk about the local situation, say in a chart. So you have a piece of of uh, a piece of complex space open and uh, a plurisubharmonic weight phi, which just means that the matrix of uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic second derivatives, um, which is uh, Hermitian, is, is definite positive. Um, you can just think of phi as a convex function if you want. Uh, then, um, Oh, uh, object of interest is a is a Hilbert space, a subspace of L2, consisting of functions which are holomorphic um, up to this weight. So um, there are two ways to define the space. Notice that here I define this this Hilbert space as a subspace of L2. Uh, equivalently, we could say that it's a space of holomorphic functions, which are L2 with respect to some weight function. And you know, you can just multiply or divide f by the weight, and the two uh, settings are equivalent. Um, it would be practical for me to to consider to consider this space as an actual subspace of of the same space L two. Um, and uh, it's a nice space because d bar and especially d bar k is a nice operator. So um, the the orthogonal projector b k from the large space L2 to the smaller space HK um, has an integral kernel. Um, what it means is simply that uh, BK, oops, BK U of X is of the form integral of BK XY U of Y DY or integrate over omega. Um, and, uh, you know, and here BK is a, you know, an actual uh, nice function. Uh, and I will use the same notation for the operator BK and for its kernel. So, yeah. um, now the question, the main question is what does, what does this kernel equivalently, what does the operator look like uh, as K tends to, to plus infinity? Uh, okay, so, um, you know, there are things happening inside and there are also things happening at the boundary of Omega, but I'm, I will be specifically not interested in what happens at the boundary. And for this, I will need to, um, to glue back several pieces of this. So uh, this is the local model and you can, can glue it back with other pieces um, to get uh, sections of line bundles. Essentially, uh, the definition of the, of the spaces HK only depends on phi modulo a harmonic function. And, and this means that it only depends on the Laplacian of phi, which I denote by omega as a, as a two form, as a one, one form. And, uh, you know, if you have a, a no-keller manifold, uh, 
in a chart, uh, you can consider um, Keller potentials phi and uh, glue back the resulting spaces and you obtain um, a space of sections of high tensor powers of an ample line bundle. The, the fact that, the, that L is uh, ample um, is equivalent to the fact that my, my weight phi was uh, plurisub subharmonic. So, uh, yeah, so this is a space of holomorphic sections. If M is compact, it's, it has finite dimension for every K. This is the nicest uh, space uh, you can imagine. All right. And uh, so, uh, as, as uh, Steve Zeldich mentioned yesterday, the first example of such a space in a case where well, uh, omega is infinite is the whole space CN uh, was the weight function uh, modulus of Z squared. And uh, so introduced by Bargman in the in the in the sixties uh, slash fifties, and um, he introduced it as uh, a good space to do quantum mechanics on. So this is a space of quantum states, uh, and we will do quantum mechanics on on this space of holomorphic sections. Uh, and um, so the first breakthrough um, was achieved. Uh, also in the 60s, uh, by the fact that this, so we're projecting on the kernel of some operator D bar K. Um, D bar K cannot be self adjoint because you know it's vector valued. So um, you, can, you can consider D bar K star D bar K. Now this is a self adjoint uh, uh, non-negative operator, semi-positive. And um, Cohn and Hernanda proved, well, something which is equivalent to the fact that um, this operator has a spectral gap. Um, in fact, the spectrum of, let me try to write again, the spectrum of uh, this, this cone Laplacian D delta K um, as a subset of the real line, positive real axis, we have many eigenvalues at zero. So this represents the space HK, right? And then you have a gap of size K. And then you have another cluster of eigenvalues. They're not exactly, you know, at the same point unless you have the, the, the flat uh, situation. Then you have another uh, distance k, and then you have another cluster, and so on. So, um, in case there are physicists in the audience, these are Landau levels, uh, and, and this operator d bar star. D bar is essentially a magnetic Laplacian. And we're considering only the first Landau level, but you can also do the semi-classical analysis of what happens for the for the, the second level, the third level, etc. We are only interested in the in this level. Um, let me tell you that this spectral gap um, is, is essential in all of the analysis because, because then um, we then we can really understand what happens for this for this uh, spectral projector. Uh, and um, the history of asymptotic formulas near the diagonal for this uh, Bergman kernel is, is large. So I've only given you a small subset of the references on the topic. Um, basically, any method will work because of the spectral gap. Uh, so, um, uh, Robert Chang mentioned yesterday the, the work of Boutet de Montvel Jostron, which can be adapted. And uh, so essentially, you're using Fourier integral operators with complex phase, which is a, a big machine of, of semi classical and micro local analysis to obtain this. Um, you can also use weighted estimates on this uh, operator and yeah, you know, uh, kind of heat kernel estimates and that kind of things. Um, to obtain this, the same results. Um, and as I say, the, there's, there's recent uh, activity uh, in the case where M is real analytic. And the, the thing is that um, in the say usual case uh, where you only assume that the, the geometric data on the manifold is smooth, then we somehow we know BK on slash near the diagonal up to any negative power of the of the of the power of the line bundle to any negative power of k, and if m is real analytic, we can improve this to an exponentially small precision. 
And that's the results that, uh, that, that I'll be presenting to you today, how to reach this exponential precision. So, okay, so um, there are lots of motivations to study the Bagman kernel in itself. So let me just uh, give to you some motivations for studying what happens. What, why is exponential precision interesting to study? Um, well, the first remark is that um, in the, in the um, somehow it's related to, to what Robert talked about yesterday, many objects related to the Bergman kernel are more natural in, the, in, the, in analytic regularity. For instance, um, for a real analytic Keller manifold, you have a notion of a Calabi diastasis function and the Calabi diastasis function will appear in the formula for the, for the Bergman kernel. And in the, in the smooth case, you obtain asymptotics of, for BK and you have to somehow cheat because the objects, the classical objects would only be naturally defined if the manifold were real analytic. And here it's much more comfortable because everything we're dealing with as a real definition, good definition. Um, the second uh, motivation is related to, to topless quantization. So as I said, you can do quantum mechanics on, on this space. And um, this exponential precision leads to um, optimal estimates for concentration of, of eigenfunctions uh, of your quantum uh, observables. Uh, so your, your typical states, typical quantum states will be localized on some part of the manifold and then very small uh, on some other parts of the manifold and how small uh, is this? They're exponentially small uh, when everything is real analytic and you cannot get better than that. So uh, this is the optimal precision. This is called uh, tunneling to mechanics. And, uh, you, and you need to use um, real analytic uh, regularity to, in order to reach this. Um, there are further nice applications. So uh, this is, related both to this and to this, but um, we can use this uh, as a, a doorway to, to the uh, geometry of Keller manifolds and more, more precisely the, the, what happens uh, for the Mabuchi space of Keller structures. So, we'll be, so this is a perspective. So I'll uh, tell you about this later. Uh, all right, so um, Semi-classical analysis can be vaguely described as the study of functions and integral kernels of operators, uh, which are in the so-called Wenzel Kramers Briouin form. So Wenzel Kramers and Briouin are three physicists of the beginning of, of the history of quantum mechanics. And they figured out that good trial states in quantum mechanics uh, have this form, right? So K is some, some large parameter and um, uh, you know a good uh, trial uh, integral kernel for BK would be um, somehow some power of K, some exponential weight. So we'll call this function psi the phase of the of the Bergman projector times some expansion uh, in decreasing powers of k, increasing powers of, of k inverse. So um, remark that you can, you can plug this in the exponential. This is expo exponential of k times something which has an, uh, an expansion powers of, of k inverse. But uh, it's more practical to put, to, to put them down and to call this the phase. And this is the symbol. Uh, the second remark is that, okay, I have dots, dots, dots. And um, for a few minutes, I will deliber deliberately be very vague in what this means. So, you know, you have some expansion and uh, for a few minutes, I won't be, be interested in whether it converges or not, just, you know, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so, um, you know, why would it be true? Um, the, the, the answer is because it's true in the, in the Bergman case. Um, and in fact, the phase is a uh, you know, good function of X and Y, and the symbol is one. So, okay, the, I've lost powers of pi and two and I here, but uh, I don't care about them. So, so this is true up to 
constant. And uh, so in the flat case, you recover one. So it stands to reason that this formula should approximately be true in the, in the general case. So at least we can try. So um, you know how to, how to tackle this, how to prove that actually this formula is true. Uh, the first step is to, uh, and indeed the first step in, in semi-classical analysis is what's called the um, stationary phase theorem, which is understanding the asymptotic properties of this kind of integrals where phi and a are real analytic. Indeed, suppose that um, we want to study properties of BK. For instance, we want to show that it's a projection. This, that means that BK, BK equals BK. And when you write BK, BK, uh, you, you compose them. Uh, well, that means that the operator is integral of BK of XY, BK of YZ, DY. So you have an integral of a Y of some exponential function of Y times some symbol depending on Y. So you need to understand these kind of integrals. This is the first step. Um, so uh, this is called stationary phase um, slash steepest descent. Um, and um, uh, okay, no, I will give you, I will tell you something about analytic regularity, the difference between C infinity case and analytic case. Um, and I'll tell you this for the standard phase. Uh, where little phi is minus x squared over four. Um, so I want to study the, an integral like this. And um, okay, there's a, the, okay, this is true uh, times a, the, there is a constant that is wrong here, but essentially this is, um, we know say by Fourier transform that um, this is, um, a heat evolution in, in small time k inverse applied to a and uh, you know this formula is defined by, by by Fourier transform but you can take it as the expansion of, of uh, you can take the power series of exponential function at zero and it works right so uh, if a is smooth it's true that you obtain this formula so for any large n, I can write the, the formula for the, the power series of the x function up to power n, and then there will be a, a, a small remainder. And, um, you know, this can be generalized, and this is what happens in this infinity case. And this is why you get uh, arbitrary polynomial precision. Um, you know, now let's suppose that A is real analytic. And, you know, uh, real analytic functions means that um, the power series converge on a fixed uh, neighborhood of the, of the real locus. So that means that I have some growth condition on these coefficients. You know, I can compute them and essentially, you know, this goes out, I have the C to J norm of A uh, for some notion of C to J norm. And essentially, uh, oops, sorry, this should be rho to the two J and this should be rho squared. So sorry, oops, this formula is wrong, but uh, let me correct it. There's a two here and a two here. All right, now it no, it's, looks good. Um, the size of the J term is, uh, uh, it involves factorials. And at the end of the day, you recover J factorial of a something to the power J. All right, this is uh, what you get. And um, what's very interesting is that, let me again correct this formula. Um, this series does not converge. Observe that, uh, you know, as J tends to infinity, uh, this tends to, to plus infinity. So, um, you know, hey, this is a fact of life that uh, even in the real analytic case, in the, for the stationary phase, lemma, things do not converge. So um, what do you do? Um, well, you look at the smallest term in this expansion. The smallest term will be reached at j approximately equal to 2k rho squared because um, um, 
because observe that if you multiply this, if you pass from j to j plus one, you will multiply by j plus one over two k rho squared. So uh, it reaches a minimum uh, around this value. And now for k large, by the Stirling formula, uh, this term is is as this asymptotic expansion, and it's indeed exponentially small in k. It's exponential of something which is strictly positive times k. And in fact, so we reach a conclusion, which is a vague conclusion, which is that analytic stationary phase is just, um, you take the ordinary stationary phase up to some power n, and then you optimize over n. Take the n such that the remainder is the best one. Uh, it turns out that um, it's, uh, you know, and then, um, it will be of the form, the best term will be proportional to, to k for some constant alpha, which depends on the radius of analyticity of a. And then the error will be exponentially small in k um, with some constant beta that again depends on the radius of analyticity, analyticity of a. So this is uh, the analytic stationary phase. And uh, okay, this is an analytic symbol. Um, and this result can be generalized. If you now you have to believe me that uh, I can do the heavy work and prove that if I replace this by any nice enough function, nice enough phase, I will reach the same kind of results. That is that you have some analytic symbol, whatever it means, and exp an, an exponentially small error. Okay, so. Um, all right, an analytic symbol is something of this form. Uh, let me give you some, some definition of, of analytic symbols. Um, this is some kind of function depending on, on, on x and on the uh, small parameter h, which is k inverse in our case. And we say that it's an analytic symbol when, and, and here you have to resist from the urge of saying that an analytic symbol is an analytic function. This is false. Right, because the, the 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 power series in powers of k inverse do not converge. There's a supplementary factorial. So what we do is we uh, we introduce the Borel transform, which is essentially the power series, uh, the Taylor infinite Taylor series with respect to h, but you divide again by j factorial. So if I just do j factorial, this is the usual Taylor series. And, uh, and I, I, I add again another factor j squared. And now I enforce that this thing uh, is a real analytic function with respect to x and to h. So um, uh, this is a, you know, uh, this is a definition. And you can work with it in practice, uh, just as in the previous slide, uh, a will be some, some series of you know, in, in, in an expansion in powers of H and with, um, with the growth condition, the CN norm of the Jth term behaves like this. And uh, so this is a very practical and down to earth definition. And uh, you can work with this or you can work with that or you can work with whatever you want. Uh, okay. Um, uh, um, a remark to make at this point is that um, analytic functions somehow are, the situation is opposed to C infinity functions in the sense that um, the vector space of analytic functions is a union of Banach spaces. The union of spaces of functions which extend up to fixed radius rho uh, with some Banach norm of that. Whereas C infinity is an intersection of CK for all K. That means that, and, and in practice, an analytic symbol is an element of some Banach space of, of analytic symbols. And for all of my theorems, uh, I can, I can um, use a Banach space of analytic functions and transform it via the inverse Borel transform into a Banach space of symbol. And um, so, 
this is an important difference and we will use the nice properties of you know linear operators in Banach spaces and apply them to 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 our analytic symbols which you cannot do in the in the C infinity case so uh, this will come to our help in a few minutes um, you know um, okay so uh, as a practical example of, of real analytic uh, um, semi-classical analysis before we go back to the to the Bergman to the study of the Bergman kernel uh, I'm going to introduce or reintroduce to you one of the main tools of, of semi-classical analysis which is pseudo differential operators so this is the next step once you have the stationary phase lemma you define pseudo differential operators what are pseudo differential operators uh, they are operators with the kernel so in some sense so this is a distributional kernel uh, so yeah anyway so the way it works is that um, you do a so so this is if you forget about a if a is one for instance this is Fourier Fourier inverse transform so what I do is that I do a Fourier Fourier inverse transform and on the middle I plug in some function of um, x plus y over two so that it's self adjoint and psi um, what does this thing do um, it, it generalizes differential operators you, you, you may remember from your from your course of, of Fourier analysis that um, differentiation is conjugated to to multiplication by by, by psi uh, by the Fourier transform so if my my function a my symbol a is a polynomial in k in psi I just obtain a differential operator. Um, and um, the point is that um, this generalization of, of differential operators is not only stable by composition um, with using the usual stationary phase, a good description modulo of any uh, power of H, but they're also stable by inverse and this is certainly not true of, of differential operators and indeed uh, this is uh, you know uh, what it means to do pde you want to invert some differential operator and of course you cannot do it without leaving the realm of differential operators but these pseudo differential operators they are stable by inverse which is why they are so useful um, and again you have a good description of the inverse modulo o of hn and um um, it's nice for quantum mechanics in this in the following sense um, that um, it's an asymptotic representation of the Poisson algebra with respect to the to the Poisson brackets into the Lie algebra of operators. That means that uh, up to the first level of precision, um, these Oh, this transformation up maps the Poisson bracket into the Lie bracket of operators. So this is nice, and uh, yeah, this means it's useful to to quantum physicists. Uh, all right. So um, what happens in the analytic case? Um, so uh, a theorem which was first proved by Boutet-Cré and and in the 60s and then the proof was simplified by Josuand in a nice book uh, which I encourage you to read if you're interested in that sort of things uh, even though it's hot uh, you can you can read it and then uh, it's very insightful um, there exist Banach norms of analytic symbols which I will not describe to you um, for which uh, composition of symbols um, is, uh, is is continuous it turns it into an algebra so uh, what this means is that uh, if I if I compose two pseudo differential operators, I again get a pseudo differential operators, and its norm as a Banach norm of analytic symbol is bounded by by the norm of A and B. Uh, and the the proof of this is, um, you know, start from the very down to earth a definition of, of analytic symbols that I gave you. And notice that if you do the stationary phase for the for the phase of so the differential operators, you get this formula for C. So um, 
if a and b are known then c is a is an expansion in powers of h and um it involves derivatives of a and b and um notice that uh, in degree g in degree j we have h to the j but we only differentiate a and j and b both j times there are no derivatives of a to the power 2j so this is a degree 2j differential operator in a and b but it's only degree j in each uh, in each of the factors and this is uh, essentially or uh, this is very important for establishing this this results so using this and uh, you know uh, counting things by hand and using uh, nice properties of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, factorials and uh, you can prove by hand you can construct a banach number of analytic symbols such that this is true and uh, yeah uh, again the situation is different from the c infinity case where just you know by exhibiting the expansion we say ah okay then we're done because now if i have some expansion in powers of of h for a and b then again i will have an expansion in powers of h for c and we're done but here we have to control the growth of the of the of the jth term of c with respect to a and b and this is this is uh, this is the hard part this is different with this infinity case uh okay so now i give you an exercise uh prove the inversion formula prove that if a is bounded away from zero then op h of a has an inverse as a pseudo differential operator modulo an exponentially small error so what do people do in the in the the usual proof in the synfinity case is the following um it's true that your first guess is up of a times up of a inverse and this works up to order h it's true that this operator is up of one minus some remainder times h and then you can correct this formula by induction you can add something here of size of size h to kill this term and now have a term of order h squared and then continue and so on and so on until you kill everything so if you give yourself some large power of h h to the big n then you can do the computation up to h to the n and that's it but um you know this induction it's very hard i mean uh, a inverse will involve a in a very messy non-linear way so uh how to prove that the coefficients in this induction are bounded as analytic symbols you don't get you will never get a formula as nice as in the previous slide so uh, if you want to do it by hand it's hard so what can we do how can we prove that uh that it also works in the analytic category If you have the answer, you can just uh, say it. Okay, so I didn't tell you many things about pseudo differential operators in analytic uh, regularity, but I did tell you that um, there are Banach norms of analytic symbols for which um, uh, composition is continuous. And once you have a uh, Banach algebra, it's easy to invert elements. You can use the usual power series, say for one plus a for inverse, and it's going to converge because uh, because of of the, of the control that we have before. So uh, one plus h r is close to to one. So and we know that the, this is the these operate these symbols they form a Banach algebra for the composition of symbols. So we can just use these results and say that, okay, uh, okay. So this should be a minus sign. But anyway, take this guy and inverse it, invert it. You, can, you write it as a power series, and this power series will converge. So I've written dot dot dot, but this series converge uh, as as it converges as analytic symbols 
because of what I told you, because uh, the, the, the product is continuous and you get, uh, you gain a factor H each time, which is certainly smaller than, than the inverse of the, the big constant C, which I gave you earlier. So, you know, we have a Banach algebra and uh, so we can invert elements and, and, and that's it. So this proof is very different from the, from the C-infinity case. You, we did not use some kind of weird induction. So, um, so you see, so yeah, analytic macrolocal analysis is interesting because you know, sometimes you have to adapt the proof from the C-infinity case and look at it in the eye and prove that it works. And sometimes you have to invent a new proof. So, and sometimes the proof is much simpler. So this proof is conceptually much simpler to than, uh, then correct uh, at every order. Uh, all right, now back to business. Uh, let me tell you something about the Bergman kernel. What we wish to prove is the following theorem that, um, okay, so I'm in a local chart. So remember I have my, my function big phi, um, which is plurisubharmonic and real analytic. And I consider psi, the holomorphic extension, I should say polarization of, of phi um, as a function which is holomorphic in one variable and anti-holomorphic in the other. Uh, I told you about the, the um, I tricked you into, into listening to this talk by talking to you about, about the Calabi diastasis function and here it is. So when you, when you look at it, uh, so this is a you know, charts definition of the, the Calabi diastasis function is equal to zero when, when X is equal to Y. So, um, and this is the phase, this will be the phase of the Bergman kernel. And uh, so we're, so indeed we're happy because this didn't exist in the, in the infinity case. And all we can do in the infinity case is try and find some almost analytic extension of phi and then cut this formula to a very tiny neighborhood of the, of the, of the diagonal. And uh, so, but, Conceptually here, again, this is, this is much simpler. So the claim is uh, that there exists an analytic symbol S such that the Bergman kernel is equal to this up to um, an, exponential, an exponentially small error in beta and exists beta positive such that um, we indeed know the Bergman kernel up to some exponentially small L. And um, remark that um, not only this is well-defined in a whole neighborhood of the, of the diagonal X equal Y, but also since this is equal to zero, um, when X is equal to Y and it decays, I promise you that it decays away from the diagonal, um, this term, is indeed an error term. This is smaller than this if X and Y are close to the diagonal. So this theorem is not empty, right? So it's a, it's a true and uh, asymptotic expansion up to, up to powers of, uh, yeah. So yeah, and uh, in a fixed neighborhood of the diagonal, I have an asymptotic expansion. And, and this can be true only in the analytic uh, regime. So if I had say, um, k to the minus infinity, then this formula, then this would be an error term of this only on a neighborhood of the diagonal of size, roughly square root of, of one over square root of k. And if you remember Robert Chang's talk yesterday, he performed the expansion in a neighborhood of the diagonal of size one over square root of k. And, and, and that's because in the, in the C infinity case, um, once you go above this, um, then the error term is not an error term anymore. It's a dominant. Um, but here you have something on a fixed neighborhood of the diagonal. Uh, yeah. Question. So, in, so it's now it's you maybe I'm not sure the case that it is uh, function that has to do with the difference between, let's say, my original curvature metric. And the metric I get from pullback by some Hobbian 2D by uh, you know bending my manifold with uh, high power and high money. 
um, okay, so um, know the difference between these will be in the, if I'm not mistaken, in the second order term. So writing this as S0. Uh, you mean this one? Well, you know, big. You mean why are you why are you happy to see the function psi? So why oh. are you happy to see the difference to psi? Ah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, okay. Observe that um, this can be defined as um, um, this is equal to uh, zero when x is equal to y. All right. And 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 here, um, this is uh, holomorphic with respect to to x, and this is anti-holomorphic with respect to y. So, in fact, e to the k. Uh, blah 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 is the only function equal to one on x equal y and such that d bar k x e to the k something is zero and d k y e to the k something is zero. Somehow this is the this is the holomorphic extension of one. But the holomorphic extension, you know, where you twist uh, your holomorphic definition of holomorphic functions by your weights of phi. I see. And you know, usually if there are no weights, the holomorphic extension of one is one. But but because I have these weights, the holomorphic extension of one is something that would decay away from the away from the diagonal, because phi is is a uh, priori subharmonic. Does does that answer your question? Or? Okay. So um, anyway, um, you know again. So um, this is precisely the formula that I gave you, if you remember, in the in the flat case x uh, modulus of x squared so so i had exactly this 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 thing so uh, and it continues to work in any for for any color potential um all right so so now uh let me explain to you um two proof strategies uh the first by uh okay so um the general thing is uh, what I call top plates operators, I should call them covariant top plates operators. Um, uh, so th this means that you take this marvelous phase function, which I which I just told you about, and you take any kind of symbol. Um, and um, this kind of operators is stable by composition. And uh, TK of A, TK of B is over from TK of C, but because um, you have to believe me that when I write TK of A, TK of B, I have a big integral over Y with this ugly phase. And if I do the computation right, at the end of the day, I get again the exact same phase. So this is this form is stable by composition. So, you know, which is good because we want the Bergman kernel to be a projector, right? So it, it should be the square of itself. So the phase function should certainly satisfy this condition. So I introduced this, these operators and um, okay, I'm cheating, I'm cheating a bit, but um, they're also a quantization. They're like pseudo differential operators, but adapted to this, to this scalar manifold uh, uh, um, context. And uh, they're related to the top list operators that Steve Zeldich told you about yesterday of the form BK multiplication BK. Uh, if you, if you know beforehand that BK is a good uh, expansion of the form that I gave you before, you can write them in this way. So 
at the end of the day, these will be equal, all of these definitions will be equivalent. But for now, they're not. But, but I, I claim that uh, this is a good family of operators. And um, what we need to prove is that uh, in this ring, uh, there is a unit, right? So there is someone, there is some symbol B, so that when I perform TK of A, TK of B, I, form, uh, I obtain TK of A for all A. So this, this TK of B will be some unit in the, in the algebra of these operators. And it's going to be precisely the, 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 the symbol of the Bergman kernel. So finding the symbol of the Bergman kernel is equivalent to finding a unit for this, for this weird product. So um, how do we find this unit? Um, the path used in Ruby, Jusson, Vignoc is to um, conjugate this problem to a problem involving only pseudo differential operators because we know pseudo differential operators, we like them very much. We know that they can be inverted so that there is a unit, et cetera. So um, you know, take your toplets operator and try to write it as a differential operator. You can do it. Um, the price is that it's um, so-called complex pseudo differential operators. Uh, that was a tool introduced by, by Jostrand um, and the uh, complex pseudo differential operators, they have the exact same definition as uh, pseudo differential operators. The only detail is that you don't integrate over psi uh, over Rn, but over some different contour. Right. And uh, yeah, and, and it's, an, it's an X and Y dependent contour. Okay. So, um this is a nice tool for for for, for um semi-classical analysis in analytic regularity and uh, they proved that there exists a, a good contour gamma and for every analytic symbol a and analytic symbol b such that i you can write tk of a as this complex fio of b and the, the, this map A of B, it's uh, an analytic elliptic Fourier integral operator. And what this curse word means is that um, this map is invertible and it's continuous between two analytic symbol spaces. So, um, you know, if you've proved this, then, then you're done because uh, then, you know, you look at this and you know, this map is invertible. And if I take B equal one, I have uh, the identity. So, uh, well, I just take the pre-image of, 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 of one and then we're done. Uh, so, um, you know, this is a high technology proof where you, you use some very clever tools, etc. cetera. So uh, what I did is a very low tech proof. So, uh, uh, but this means more work. Uh, so, um, as for pseudo differential operators, we know because it's true in the smooth case that TK of A, TK of B is TK of the same kind of formula as in, as in the uh, pseudo differential operator K, case. Some expansion in powers of, of K inverse times some differential operator in A and B. And notice that, you know, I didn't put anything here. And you know this is shorthand for dot dot dot. So you know, uh, well, you know these uh, these differential op by differential operators exist. Um, and the thing is that, as in the pseudo differential case, these CJ have total order two J, but they only differentiate up to J times in A and up to J times in B. And this means that. Uh, if you really like uh, pro proving things with, uh, with the quotients of factorials, et cetera, you can essentially um, redo the proof of, of, uh, of a boute cré or the proof of Jostrom uh, that uh, there exists an uh, uh, Banach uh, space of symbols for which the, the product is continuous. You can also do it in this case using this fact. 
uh, because the, the count of derivatives is the same. So, uh, so this is the only some of the 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 only thing we need uh, to obtain that there is a there is a, a Banach there is a, a Banach space of symbols for which the product is is continuous. Um, and once it's there, again, as in the exercise that I gave you, uh, uh, we, we can conclude the proof that there is a unit by by um, uh, Inverting the by by, by uh, yeah by the, the convergence of power series for for for, for a inverse. Uh, so yeah, so okay. Um, what's next? So what I also did. Uh, so I told you about exponential concentration and like uh, tunneling for for quantum states, and I did this in the in the same article. Um, so these proofs were the, the two proofs that I told you about. There were the early proofs, now there are shorter proofs. We, we found shortcuts uh, in these proofs. So there are, there are shorter proofs by Charles, Ezari and his collaborators. Um, there's a nice new proof by De Lepart, Hittrick, Restaurant, where we just, where we deform the right contours and, and then it works. It's kind of, you know, it's a bit magical, I should say. Uh, uh, as I advertised to you, and this is a work in progress, we're trying to understand the Mabuchi space of color structures of a, of a manifold as a space of operators in WKB form. So uh, for various interplates operators, you keep the same phase as the Bergman kernel and try a different symbol. You know, what if you also change the phase? And then you obtain essentially uh, a different point in Mabuchi space. So that's what we're doing. And uh, uh, another work in progress is related to what, what uh, Robert was telling you about uh, yesterday. Um, so this high powers of, uh, of uh, weights inside the domain is related to the, to the case of, uh, of um, a projector where there is no weight function, but the boundary of, of the set omega is real analytic, is, is real analytic and, uh, Levy pseudo convex. And in this case, uh, you have a similar analysis, and we're, we're trying to, to, to push this analysis to the, to the analytic case. Um, another exciting perspective um, is a spectral theory of, for non self adjoint toplet operators. Uh, what happens to the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions for these toplet operators, um, like this one, but in the case where uh, A is complex valued. Um, this, um, to do this kind of things, um, you need a real analytic uh, regularity. So all of this was kind of preparation for, for, for this thing. It, it, it cannot be done in this infinity case. So, so it's a challenging new perspective. Um, all right, I'm done. Thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot. Other questions or remarks? So the, the analysis is just... in H, and so the okay, older, and when, what I do, one doesn't typically require analysticity in H. What is, what was the real reason you needed analysticity in H ultimately? Um, okay, so, well. I mean, analytic symbols, you know, in the older literature are defined by requiring Cauchy estimates and the, I guess your X's are the, you know. Yeah. So I'm just wondering why you, what you require analyticity. Uh, I mean, okay. Analyticity is, I mean, okay. So, okay. I should say that A is not real analytic in, in H. It's only it's Bora transform who is. And, and this is, this definition is just a, it's a placeholder for these kind of estimates. It's, it's, it's equivalent to these kind of estimates. So all I'm really needing is, is these kind of estimates. It's, it's no different. It's just a more concise definition. So you just define the standard and then you sort of yeah. That's So yeah, analyticity with respect to H at the end of the day, sometime occurs. Um, as, you, as you might know, it's known as resurgence. Yeah. But you know, this is kind of... Uh, 
just require the standard estimates. Yes, I require the standard estimates. Yeah, not the not not analyticity with respect to H. So this is analyticity with respect to H. When it happens, is magical. Further questions? So maybe can you comment on this? Uh, you, in the last slide, you said you want to study the space of Kähler structures. Okay, so this means you fix a class on a compact Kähler manifold, and yes. you you want to find uh, okay, you okay some representative, and then you do i del L bar phi, and okay, you want to understand what you can do by varying phi. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So this means you you restrict to real analytic phi there, or I mean you said that the techniques are somehow require underlying geometry to be real yes. analytic so yes. you you fix a you fix a Kähler class you fix one real analytic metric in the Kähler class which exists yes and then you you vary by other real analytic yes. phi yes okay yes you know the thing is that uh and the, you do the, that so, the, sorry so, so you do that because you know that maybe you're looking for Kähler Einstein metrics or whatever in the end they they so, will be they will be real analytics so yeah. yes that's one of the reasons the other reason is that the the geodesic equation from Abuchi space if you're looking at the initial value problem it's it it, it explodes immediately even for infinity functions there is no um, short time uh, existence of the of a solution with prescribed Cauchy data, it's true in the reality case because you know because of the standard Cauchy Kovalevskaya theorem. But it is it's the only case in in which it's true. And somehow, uh, you know, it's one of the hard things to understand the geometry of of Mabuchi space. Um, is is very different depending on the degree of regularity which you are interested in. For instance, we know that. Even two metrics, even C11 metrics, there is a there is C11 geodesic between them. Um, but uh, you know, this should not be true in the analytic case. If I take two close analytic metrics, they should not be connected by an analytic geodesic. So, okay, so but then the I mean the okay, sorry, the the somehow heuristics for this uh, standard case is like an infinite dimensional non compact Riemannian symmetric space, yes. where, of course, you expect this to be true that you are essentially connecting points by unique geodesics. Yes. So, is there a guess what the somehow, uh, what, how should one should think about this uh, in terms of limits of uh, classic, I mean, finite dimensional Riemannian geometry? Exactly, because there is a, you can quantize. Uh, changes in Mabuchi space by the something called the Hilp K map. You can quantize them as changes of metrics on on H K. And the big uh, the big thing is that how can you use this to you? Uh, so the thing downstairs is very well understood because it's a space of um, you know uh, scalar products on a finite dimensional space. And um, how closely does it resemble the thing uh, the thing above? So. Yeah, Chen and Sun, for instance, they already used uh, this this help K map to 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 study the the, the geodesics upstairs by projecting them downstairs and studying what they what they mean uh, in the well known downstairs uh, space. And uh, yeah, we're trying to get to get beyond that, but for the moment we need real analyticity, reasonable. which is reasonable. Yes, yes, yes. Are there further questions? So, can you use um, analyticity to calculate coefficients uh, of the expansion uh, um, very quickly somehow? Of the Bergman Gana? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll give you an answer which may not please you is that, you know, there is a formula present in the, in the paper by Laurent Charles at, at CMP. And um, can we improve on this formula? Maybe. Uh, so so the coefficients are basically known, but can you use, you know, <laughs> if it's analytic, we expand something and you get them for free somehow quickly, hmm. at least formally. <laughs> it's a good question. I have to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Also linked to his question yesterday. On, yes. On this. Yes. Yes. But if you click on the chat, 
Huh? Question. Is there some kind of trade off choosing the asymptotic expansion with exponential small error term instead of the traditional expansion with error term O to the K to the minus N? Uh, well, um, I don't know what you mean by trade off. So, okay. The trade off is that you have to work more to get it. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, so if, if you, if you give more time, you get a better expansion. So, um, and, and you need more regularity. Um, the thing is, so I don't know if that answers your question. Another possible answer is that you can interpolate between the analytic case and the C infinity case by the well-known Gevray classes. And, and, and there you can, you know, connect the dots uh, and you have to work even more. So I don't know if it's a trade-off because you work more and you get a worse expansion, so. <laughs> Other questions? Then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.